the monks or the nuns um, are given small cash sums in order to enable them to um, pass their first few days outside of the monastery because he writes complaining letters to Cromwell saying, look, I'm massively out of pocket because I keep having to go and effectively find some cash of my own to, to, to give these people something to go out of the house with under cover of darkness. They're going to, you know, jam, jemmy open the doors and start helping themselves to bits of architectural salvage. And we know that they do that. At what point do we see, or is it is it is it clear at all, the decision that everything is going to have to go? The catalyst, I think, and I argue in the book, really is a um, a sudden crisis of confidence that comes on Henry between fifteen thirty eight and fifteen thirty nine, um, and it's a crisis of confidence over how bought into his headship of the church. Uh, people really are. Um, so I've said that in the immediate wake of that declaring himself head of the church, there's a strong sense of what we would call, I suppose, buy-in that um, the church leadership and the monastery leadership especially seems to be disposed to be optimistic about this new departure. But undoubtedly the pilgrimage of grace, but also then rumours and suspicions of this and that conspiracy and reports of undermining royal authority that are filtering their way through to Henry from monasteries. Um, reports that the monasteries are not going to be a hugely cooperative over Henry doing what he likes with this bit of property, that bit of property. Because once he becomes head of the church, he really does want to meddle with uh, their property. And that meddling is going on and on um, through the 1530s. Um, those reports, I think, come to Henry to the point, to reach a tipping point with him in 1538, 1539, um, not helped by the fact that he discovers his longtime favourite, Henry Courtney, Marquis of Exeter, is implicated in a conspiracy and Henry Courtney and his wife had for a long time been under some suspicion that they were not sympathetic to religious reformation, uh, not opposed necessarily to the headship of the church, but they were staunch Catholics. Um, and I think these are coming together to act on what in Henry is, is always a fair degree of paranoia. Um, and, and I think yeah, that brings on a crisis of confidence, if you like, a panic, um, a sense of sort of psychological undermining that is acting on him. And it's, it is that, in his mind and therefore for Cromwell, is accelerating the process as we move into 1539. At the same time that because of the Crown's meddling and Cromwell's tendency not just to remind <clears throat> the remaining monasteries that the king is head of the church, but therefore to um, keep pressing them for <clears throat> uh, gifts of cash, for fines, for minor misdemeanors, you know, oh, you leased that property without telling me or the king, I'm going to impose a fine on you for doing that. And the kind of interference that you get when there's a new, a new figure in charge, if you like. Um, that is undoubtedly draining the monasteries of ready cash and, and income. And there is a, a, a growing sense for some of giving up the ghost at the same time as the king's paranoia is, is growing. That said, that hierarchy of royal abbeys, um, cathedrals that were also monastic priories, even in the autumn and winter of 1539, they don't believe that the end has come. They believe that they still have a part in Henry's grand plan, that they can still negotiate. Um, maybe we should become a cathedral. We know you want more cathedrals. 
maybe we should become a grand collegiate church or some other part of your new wonderful royal church. Um, maybe we should become a palace monastery. And a number of these around the country are absolutely convinced that there isn't an end. There may be a ne negotiation to come, but it's coming. Um, and places like the monastery, the cathedral monastery at Canterbury, the, the great royal abbey at Waltham in Essex. Um, places like this believe, as we move into, into sort of Christmas 1539, they believe that that's what's coming for them. Um, uh, more royal favour and so on. So um, even at the last, it's, um, there's a lack of clarity, a lack of certainty as to, as to what happens. But it's, it's clear for Cromwell, I think, by the time we move into 1540, that um, this must be a sort of tidying up process. By, by Christmas 1539, most have gone. Um, and um, there is a sort of tidying up process. But when the commissioners arrive at Canterbury, um, just before Easter 1540, I think still even then, go back a week or two, and they wouldn't necessarily have said, it's happening now. Um, uh, so it's extraordinary that the, the greatest drama of Henry's Reformation is also the most uncertain, um, which seems like a contradiction, but, but, but there it is. It, it's incredible. It's such a different story once you get into it to what we, um, yeah, have been sort of told, um, like you say, over the last sort of 20 years especially. It's sort of become an appendage to the Henry VIII and Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon and Boleyn story. Mm. Um, and we've been talking for ages now and we could just keep going. <laughs> There's so many other questions that I would love to ask you. But let's finish um, the main part of the interview before I get you to tell everyone where they can find you. But the main part of the interview with this question, had it not been for Henry's what turned out to be the whole scale dissolution of, of religious houses. Do you think we would still have them today? No, I don't. I think, um, I mean, we must be wary of anticipating what's coming. You know, we mm. living hundred years later, we have the, the, the huge advantage of knowing what happened next, but um, it's hard to see how even a handful of great Royal abbeys could have survived the Commonwealth. Um, we have to remember again a period of history that actually seems sometimes that we we don't remind ourselves of enough. What happened? We we had the disestablishment of the church. We had the closure of um, the removal of bishops, the closure of churches, um, uh, a threat to to see cathedrals even torn down. Um, there is no way that ancient medieval abbeys could have survived that that process. Um, uh, also, having had a taste of what the redistribution of real estate looked like, it's pretty clear, even by the time Mary comes to the throne in 1553, it's pretty clear that the elite, if you like, the social elite of England, um, have no desire to see great ecclesiastical institutions, again, hold the lion's share of property in the country. Um, I don't think Mary did want to re-establish all monasteries, but even if she'd wanted to or people around her wanted to, it wouldn't have been possible. Not for any other reason than society wouldn't have gone along with it. Um, the release of property on a scale that hadn't been seen since the Norman Conquest is something that is from the outset, reshaping this provincial kingdom um, from villages and small towns upwards into cities. Um, it, the, the opportunity to sort of almost reshape local infrastructure is something that provincial England seizes and it's not going to let go of. And I, I think that and the assault on any established church at all that Cromwell leads um, in the 1650s would have been the death. So, um, so no. Um, and of course, the monastic tradition in Catholic Europe, meanwhile, while all of this is going on in England, is moving on. And monasticism itself as an ideal, as a sort of culture, 
is developing through the Counter Reformation. So whatever came back, and when it does come back, you know, it comes back um, through recusancy movements in Elizabeth's reign, and then it comes back again, of course, after Catholic emancipation. What comes back is necessarily quite different. So um, medieval monasticism as a tradition is dead in at Easter 1540, and anything that would have come back would not have looked like it. It's great, great to end on that one. Thank you. So before we do end the main part of the interview, and we'll, we've got some Patreon questions, which we'll finish off with um, for, for my patrons. But um, can, you, can we just take this opportunity to let know pe people know uh, where they can find you if they want to? I don't know if you do social media, where they can get your book, etc. Yes, indeed. So um, uh, you can find me um, certainly on Twitter. Um, uh, I, I do tweet about um, research and, and medieval and early modern history and, and monastic sites and heritage. Um, so it's um, James G. Clark. Um, uh, so please do um, find me there uh, and I'll be glad to find uh, anyone. Um, the book is uh, now in paperback with Yale and you'll find it in any um, uh, high street bookstore uh, and, of course, um, online. And um, uh, I do um, uh, quite actively speak around the country. And um, uh, so uh, and I will usually be tweeting about where I'm going to be coming to to join a, uh, a session and, and, and talk next. So um, uh, I, and it's always great to, to meet people who are interested in this subject and um, and and might have been reading the book so um i'd be glad to to see anyone there brilliant thank you james if anne had still been queen at the end of the 1530s would she have been more active in taking some of that wealth recovered from the church and putting it to other uses the the original intention for henry undoubtedly is simply to bring the church closer to uh, himself and to royal authority, to bring it under uh, royal control. I don't think Henry has a fully formed plan as to where he goes from there. But I think even Cromwell, with that rather more um, thoughtful appraisal of how a church under royal control could be managed, I don't think for much of the 1530s he's thinking that it needs to go systematically towards taking down the church completely um, and the great monastery institutions. I think for Cromwell, he sees the church as a, as a resource, once brought under the crown's control, is there for the crown to, as it were, manage and, and draw on uh, as, as they see fit over the coming years without really a strongly predetermined sense of, of the direction that might take. So even perhaps in the early months of 1540, I don't think that they want necessarily to see those churches closed. They are more useful to the Tudor crown, to the Tudor regime, as long as they remain there and present on people's horizons because they are so bound up with the ancient past of England, and they are so bound up with the Christian tradition in England. Those things are assets which Henry doesn't want to take for himself, but rather sort of channel into the image of the Tudor monarchy.